Hello. I'm live here at the Walter Bosley channel. And yes, this is one of those places where we have discussions on um, uh, hypotheses, speculations. The word speculation and the word speculative are not, uh, are not no-nos here. In fact, that's, that's where we go very often, okay? And, um, you know, um, materialists and certainty fetishists uh, don't have much fun here. So, um, you know, just welcome back all you folks who are here in the live chat. I see you there and the others who may be watching. And we have several new subscribers joining on and... Um, we welcome you, and I look forward to your feedback on all the episodes, but uh, including today's. So uh, today we have returning our good friend, Dr. Joseph Farrell, and um, the, where he's at, the weather has been crazy, so um, we got a, 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 a pocket of calm, and we're able to make it work have him back in today's discussion. I think you guys are going to find really interesting, really fascinating. It's um, something that uh, you know, a lot of people out there are talking about, of course, here and today. I'm sure we'll have uh, our unique two cents to put into it. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring in our friend, Joseph Farrell. Joseph, welcome. Hey there. <laughs> well, are, 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 are things a little more calm back there weather-wise? Right oh, now? God, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had rain that froze, and then it started to melt just enough. And then on top of the ice, we had more rain. Oh, and my pipes froze and then busted and you know it's just not oh been God. it's not been a happy time here let me tell oh, you oh <laughs> lordy and um now i'm guessing that your um oh my gosh your uh shelter your storm shelter seals up good enough that you don't have to worry about any kind of flooding getting in right no that yeah that that's okay um it's it's just the problem that you know in this part of the country a lot of the houses don't have basements number one right and the pipes are not you know they're not laid nearly deep enough for this kind of weather mm. so you know mm. i've i've but then again you know i've heard i have a lot of people on my website up in you know in the part of the country that i hail from and some members up in canada and they've told me that their pipes have frozen as well. I I, I yeah. gotta tell you, you know, I I'm from South Dakota, so I know what to do when it gets this cold. You open the cupboards and make sure the heat gets into your pipes, and you leave your pipes dripping. Well, I did all of that, and they still froze. <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> so anyway, well, it, it's it's been it's been crazy all yeah. over the continent. Yeah, you know, yeah. with um, I I remember a weather map. Uh, last week, I think it was maybe the week before everything was blue on yep. their color code, except, um, where I'm at here yep. in Southern California and Florida. Yep. And, and even in where I'm at, it wasn't as orange and red as it was in Florida. So and that's yep. insane when it gets yep. like that. So that's what yep. you've been putting up. Well, with. So, you know, as I say, weather derivatives are a handy financial instrument to have around when you can modify the weather. So. <laughs> There you go. There you go. And of course, what better segue than going from biblical proportion weather to <laughs> a discussion on the book of Enoch, which uh, mm -hmm. many, a lot of folks, particularly folks here, I think, are, they have a basic familiarity with the book of Enoch. Mm -hmm. And um, naturally, the curiosity goes to the more mysterious elements uh -huh. of that uh -huh. work, which is a combination of works, of course. Um, and, and in particular, um, of course, the watchers. And I, you know, I, I, I want to get into that. And I want to get into, you know, we'll start with your perspective as a theologian, a scholar uh -huh. in that uh, regard. And um, 
tell us from your perspective what the book of Enoch is, in your opinion. Well, the book of Enoch, there's actually, it's important for people to understand that, that the book exists in two basic and slightly different versions. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that most people think of when they refer to the book of Enoch is the Ethiopian version. It's actually a part of uh, the biblical canon in the Ethiopian Coptic church. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you have a Bible in Ethiopian, it's going to contain the, the Ethiopian version of the book of Enoch. Um, and then there is a, a Slavonic text in, in Old Church Slavonic that, again, you know, this is, this is how crazy the book of Enoch is. We've got an Ethiopian version, and then we've got a version all the way up in, you know, in Russia that uh, is is Old Church Slavonic, and that's a slightly different version. People might uh, know that version by the name of the Book of the Secrets of Enoch. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, I have I brought my copy off the shelf to show people. That's the version that I have is the Slavonic text. Uh, it's this is a fairly rare version of of it. It's hard to find. But in the Slavonic version, you have a slightly longer text. Uh, there are portions of the book in the Slavonic version that you're not going to find in the Ethiopian version and so on. Uh, both versions, it's important to know, are quoted by some church fathers, they're quoted by, you know, other texts and so on and so forth. And you even have a reference to the book of Enoch in the New Testament book of Jude. Mm -hmm. And what this means is that most scholars um, think that the two versions that we have extant now, the Ethiopian and the church Slavonic, are based on a Greek text, an underlying Greek text. Mm -hmm. And it seems fairly clear when you look at both versions that the book itself is, is coming out of that uh, Jewish milieu in and around Alexandria, Egypt. So you get a little bit of Egyptian uh, religious teaching in the book. You get a little bit of, of, obviously, of Jewish teaching. You get a little Christian teaching and so on. So the book is really kind of eclectic when you when you look at the contents. It's an mm -hmm. old book. There, There's no doubt that uh, whatever text may underlie the text that we have now, there's no doubt that it's an early book, probably in... I would say maybe the first century BC to the second century AD. It's in that kind of time frame that, that you're mm -hmm. looking at. Okay. Okay. And um, of course, it was once very common, very popular. We're yes. talking ages ago. And then, of course, it became banned and disappeared totally for a while. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it totally disappeared <clears throat> until about. Uh, I would say, with the exception of the Ethiopian church, it, it really kind of disappears until the Slavonic text reemerges in, in the popular consciousness. And, and most of the, um, most of the ju really juicy stuff for our purposes mm -hmm. is, is going to be in the Slavonic text. Okay. Uh, because it, it is a slightly, it's a slightly longer text. Uh, most of the manuscripts are older, or pardon me, are, are younger for the Slavonic text, but I, I don't think that 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 means that the the ideas in the text are new. I think I think again, you're dealing like the Septuagint, you're dealing with two textual traditions, mm -hmm. and the earliest manuscripts have simply been lost. Um, you don't have to dig long or hard to find other manuscripts that are very early that contain similar ideas to the Slavonic text of Enoch. Once it was rediscovered uh, and, and translated into English in the 19th century, the, the church Slavonic version, you know, interest in, interest in the book of Enoch really took off. Um, right. So it was the Slavonic text that kind of did it. 
Okay. Is the Slavonic text, or, or maybe it's in both, um, the, the, the part where Enoch is taken and um, shown these beings... Yes, uh, measuring the earth, measuring the stars, and and is that's in the is that in both the yeah. Slavonic and the other one? Okay, yeah, it's okay. in both, but you're going to have a you're going to have a, a kind of um, fleshed out version of it in the Slavonic text. Okay, which is okay. why I think the Slavonic text has caught people's imagination. Is is this more interesting in that respect? <laughs> Right, right. Who who do you think? Um, now it's been a while since mm -hmm. I've really um, dug into it, um, and I was just doing some basic review today. Mm -hmm. But uh, are the watchers the ones who I just referred to? The ones who show Enoch? Yes, they, they do the measurements. So so yeah. and and those are the same as in the tradition that these watchers are the fallen angels, correct? Um. Well, it, the watchers in the book of Enoch are partly the fallen angels, but it's kind of an ambiguous text. Um, I, I need to take care of an inaccuracy in your chat room. This, if I don't do this, it's going to distract my do mind it. for the rest of the conversation. Do it. Somebody in the chat room says, was St. Cyril of Alexandria responsible for the Slavonic text? And in parenthesis, she says, creator of Cyrillic. Cyril of Alexandria had nothing to do with the creation of the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, the, the Cyrillic alphabet in Russia, the, the Church Slavonic, was the creation of St. Cyril the, and Methodius. Cyril of Alexandria is 4th and 5th century. Cyril and Methodius are ninth century nothing to do with each other <laughs> okay he has nothing to do with with the book of enoch anyway yeah. the the watchers and and the angels in the book of enoch it's actually the angels that are taking enoch and showing him all of this stuff in heaven and it's very clear the the gregory in in the book of enoch the watchers mm -hmm. are associated with the fallen angels uh, but there is a bit of ambiguity there. Uh, you have mm -hmm. to be kind of careful on how you on how you you can't really you can't really read the text and make these nice neat cleavages and divisions. Right. The interesting thing about the Watchers in in the Slavonic text is that they're kind of responsible for not only keeping an eye on mankind on earth, but they're also supposed to kind of keep an eye on the departed dead souls of mankind that inhabit that region between the earth and the moon. <laughs> so, so oh, I'm the, glad you mentioned the moon. Cause I will have a moon question later, but oh yeah. Ahead. Well, that the moon <laughs> figures into the Slavonic text of Enoch in a major way. Oh <laughs> yeah, um, those who okay. those who are familiar with my conference uh, presentation at at the Bastrop conference that you and I are mm -hmm. at, uh, I talked about the Book of Enoch in that in that uh, in that mm -hmm. presentation and with respect to the moon. So we'll probably get back to that. Oh yes, oh yes, definitely. Now, um, oh. The question was on the tip of my tongue. It'll it'll come back to me. We were talking about these these angels that show Enoch. Um, oh, okay, yeah. In a previous episode, uh -huh. we discussed a more um, a, a different nature of the angels when we were talking about the the plasma okay. discussion right. and how the angels are these different kind of beings. Now, when we get to the story of the angels mixing it up with the earth women mm -hmm. are, are these different beings do they manifest themselves in a human form if, from your perspective how do we reconcile that conversation about the angels of these strange beings and then these humanoid forms that are okay, having I sex with virtually with women? virtually every uh tradition within within christianity with within traditional christianity i'm not talking mm -hmm. the modern neo-gnostic nonsense right um 
basically every tradition will say that angels are capable of of assuming shapes or appearances right that are you know pleasing to man yes in other words they can appear like like human beings mm-hmm. um and virtually every one of them in my demon in the acre book you know i have that long section of quotation Mm -hmm. Uh, from St. John of Damascus. And you you definitely get the idea from reading his text and other texts from from some of the church fathers that not only are they capable of shape-shifting, quite literally, Mm -hmm. but in the process of doing that, they are capable of assuming for a, a certain period of time an actual physical, you know, corporeal form. Mm hmm uh, so you know, there's there's really no departure from that idea in the Book of Enoch because even there you have clear suggestion that the angel that's taking him around and showing him stuff is assuming some sort of form that he can see and talk to. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, now, do you see um, that the the let's the concept of the fallen angels? Could they actually be what makes up the um, the uh, uh, the pantheistic uh, gods and goddesses, so to speak? Like I, sure. I saw one scholar um, com- say that Zeus could have been one of these fallen angels because sure. we know that he would interact with human females and well, and, that's. Uh, that's not only possible, but that's actually the idea that some of the very earliest uh, church fathers and ecclesiastical writers say is that, you know, for them, the gods of, of the ancients aren't unreal just because they're gods. What they actually say is that, that men, in many cases, they're, they're demons, they're fallen angels. And some of them, not all of them, but some of them will even go so far as to tell you that that some of these gods are not necessarily even demons. They're just angels uh, doing what they were instructed to do. That's a, you know, that's a very, very old view. And it's, you know, it's Hmm. been around, um, it's been around in ecclesiastical tradition for a very, very long time, almost since the inception. Um, Do you subscribe much to the idea that uh, some people say, well, they were just from, some civilization across the stars, essentially extraterrestrials. Or it, to me, when I read this mm-hmm. stuff, it it my understanding is they're more than just some extraterrestrial. Oh um, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I if you know if if you're if you're looking at texts like uh, the text I cite in in Demon in the Acre from from Saint John of Damascus, or if you're looking mm-hmm. at books like Enoch. Uh, or, you know, even a lot of the Gnostic texts, you know, that, that we're familiar with, hypostasis of the archons and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. If you look at those texts and, and you're reading about these archons or angels or, you know, whatever the text is calling them, um, I think it's very clear that you're not dealing with your average run-of-the-mill gray or insectoid or right. blonde alien, you're dealing with a wholly different kind of life form mm-hmm. that in mm-hmm. in special circumstances can appear like us, but isn't us. There, you know, there's no two ways about it, is not us. Um, you know, I in in the demon in the acre, I put some artistic depictions, pictures of angels as they're described in the Bible. And I mean, you know, these things look, you know, wild. yeah, they're wild because, you know, there's four or five different axes of symmetry on these things. Yeah. You know, they're like Ezekiel's descriptions. Yeah. They're like Ezekiel's description. You know, they're like that weird space movie with Matthew McConaughey, where he's in some sort of hyperdimensional space and you see all this, you know, the Tesseract. Yeah. Yeah. The Tesseract. They're like these Escher paintings, you know, come to life. Right. So, or or maybe if, if Kubrick could have depicted it that way, maybe what Bowman is seeing when he's, yeah, exactly. Would would be these things. Now um, in my look at this and part of the reason I wanted to want to, well, 
one of the topics I wanted to cover was you have talked before about um, Earth being, uh, if not a prison planet, a quarantine zone. Uh And, you know, I was wondering, well, I wonder if our interaction with these watchers, particularly the fallen ones who interacted Uh with us a little too closely, I wonder Uh if that's what got us quarantined because the things that they taught us according to the lore, warfare Uh and technology and stuff could and, you know, might have led to, for instance, the Giza Death Star type of technology. Uh And so I'm thinking it was these fallen watchers who possibly got us into trouble to begin with. Well, yeah, I, I, I absolutely think so. I mean, you, you read any version of the fall, biblical or otherwise, and it's always mm-hmm. this, uh, it's always some outside external influence that is tempting mankind away from, from the original innocence. Mm-hmm. And so there's some sort of, of technological thing implied in most esoteric texts you even get a a slight hint of it Mm -hmm. in the genesis version in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall Mm -hmm. surely die so in other words the idea of knowledge science technology you know all of this is always emphasized in all of these stories so could it could that have been responsible for the quarantine zone yeah but I think I think the other thing about the quarantine zone, at least from the way I'm reading these texts, mm-hmm. is that the quarantine zone is a result of the fall. And it's a result of the fall with respect to a war that we either initiated or attempted to conclude with an act of dramatic, mind-boggling violence. Mm. Um so yeah, if you if you're going to blow up a planet in your own cel- stellar system, you, you better quarantine the monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> keep the, keep, yeah, keep, keep them corralled. The yeah, yeah. You know, we're we're kind of the celestial Germans here, folks. <laughs> that, <laughs> oh, that's, yikes. that's what we are. So, yeah, you know, um, the quarantine zone itself. This is the interesting thing. There are two versions of it in esoteric lore. Mm -hmm. And the Book of Enoch is preserving one of those, and it's precisely the Slavonic text that's preserving the second version. In one version of of, that is handed down in the lore, the quarantine zone is at the orbit of the outermost planet, which, of course, in that time would have been Saturn. Okay? Okay. So you have this association of the war, Saturn, the Gigantomachy in Greek mythology, and so on. And that's the boundary of the quarantine zone. We're not supposed to go beyond that or or to to use the the real terms, I think. We're not supposed to militarize that zone. The oh. quor- by quarantine zone here, folks, what I'm trying to suggest is the Uh, And I did this in in the Bastrop uh, presentation at the Bastrop Secret Space Program conference. The quarantine zone is really a demilitarized zone. So think of the quarantine zone as the Treaty of Versailles demilitarized zone that the Allies imposed on Germany, that they could not station any troops or have any mobilization facilities on the west bank of the Rhine River. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is what the quarantine zone is. We're not allowed to weaponize the space in that area. The other version, uh, yeah, we're in... in Uh, So this is why folks are concerned about Space Force. Yes. Uh, You know, the, the reason I think that we're sending out space probes with little plaques that say we come in peace from is precisely because somebody in the deep state was worried about the idea of violating some sort of treaty. Hmm. Uh, the other quarantine zone that's mentioned in Enoch is at the orbit of the moon, which is, you know, a much smaller, tighter quarantine zone. But again, mm-hmm. the idea is we're not supposed to, uh, 
weaponize that area of space. And the other thing in the Book of Enoch, as I say, is that that is also the boundary region for the souls of the departed. Is they, They're said to dwell in the space between the Earth and the orbit of the moon. That's, yeah, it's a strange idea. <laughs> that That's like a whole other conversation right yep. there. Well, a couple of other things that came up in some of the research I was doing, questions other people were asking and exploring. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and since we mentioned the moon, I'll do that one first. But uh -huh. uh, it, it occurred to me, I was going to ask you, um, you know, the the various scriptures, the, the Bible included, Genesis, talks about how the um, offspring of mm -hmm. these fallen watchers and the earth women, the Nephilim mm -hmm. had to be wiped out because of course they were the giants. They mm -hmm. began eating human flesh and drinking mm -hmm. the blood mm -hmm. and all of this. So they had to be wiped out. Um, now I know the story tells us that it gives us the impression that, okay, it worked, but two things arise. The first thing I'll ask is um, the, the, the watchers, the fallen watchers, mm -hmm. um, could they be in the moon? Was sure. my thought. Sure. And could they have been the ones who, according to the uh, hypothesis, scared us off of the moon? Sure. Or maybe that was the reason we were scared off. Is sure. In Absolutely. Um, in fact, I think you know. I I think if you're going to if you're going to have a a quarantine zone, you have to be able mm -hmm. to enforce the quarantine. Yeah. So, you know, I saw the question in your chat room. Someone was asking, well, who's who's going to enforce all of this? Well, look back at the Treaty of Versailles. What did the Allies stipulate in the Treaty of Versailles as to how they're going to enforce the non-armament provisions of the treaty? Well, the treaty specifically gave the British and the French and by extension later, the Americans and, and the Italians, gave their military attaches to their embassies in Germany full access at any moment without any announcement needed to inspect any German factory and especially any German factory associated with armaments production. So the Allies literally could go around Germany and inspect and make sure that the Germans were not producing the weapon systems that the Treaty of Versailles specified they could not produce. That's why the Germans farmed all that production out to Russia. <laughs> you right. know? Well, so, well, what you're talking about, too, the first thing that comes to my mind is the question is, is could this be why we see UFOs around our nuclear missile bases? Ding, ding, ding. Exactly. Ding, ding, ding. Exactly. And okay. if you're going to have a base for it, you know, for conducting that type of, of surveillance and monitoring, well, the moon is pretty dang handy. Yeah. You know, and the other thing that's real handy is Antarctica. <laughs> exactly. There it is, folks. There it is. You know, yeah. right there, right there on our own planet. And, I, you know, I'm in that school of thought that um, has, has it been confirmed that... Um, Buzz Aldrin made the statement, right, uh -huh, uh -huh. Th about the great evil down there. That's confirmed that he actually did what he, he tweeted that or something. He Now, I have not found confirmation. If you have, I'd like to see it. I, yeah, have I, heard I haven't it. either. Yeah. Well, I, I have heard this, and it's been repeated. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think the probability is he said something like that that may have gotten twisted or something. But he did, it is true, that he did get sick down there and hightailed it out yes. of Antarctica and has really not said very much about what yeah. he saw or did or found down there since then. Well, you know, we're talking about scriptural topics here relative mm -hmm. to this and the Book of Enoch in particular, and you're talking about how the real juicy stuff that we're interested in is in the Slavonic text. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, this whole Book of Enoch thing, milieu, kind of possibly explains the uh, the, the patriarch's visit to Antarctica. Oh, absolutely. It, it, well, get ready for it. Pope Francis is planning a visit there, too. 
you know, anything anything Orthodox patriarchs can do, we Latin popes can do too. You know, the, <laughs> yeah, it, it's that it's that old rivalry. But anyway, um, I it not only would explain that, it would explain you know why s- the Secretary of State has to take a trip to Antarctica in the middle of a diplomatic junket in the middle of one of the most hotly contested American presidential elections in history. Well, you know, if you've got that kind of stuff going on and then the visit of King Juan Carlos and all sorts of British royals and so on, all of that activity suggests to me that there's some sort of diplomatic activity going on down there. Sure, sure. And, um, you know, it, it's similar to um, uh, Bariloche, you know, with the presidents exactly. going down to Bariloche since World War II, you know, exactly. just exactly who and why, you know, right. are they meeting with down there? And then now Antarctica. Um, right. I, I've always thought that one of the, um, I don't want to say dirty little secrets, but little secrets of uh knowledge of um the whole ufo question and et's and Mm -hmm. and um in general and human history Mm -hmm. is that of course there is otherworldly blood otherworldly dna in Mm -hmm. our you know and and i'm talking you know uh, across the whole globe there's Mm -hmm. a whole i would say most of us have it to varying degrees if not most of us many to varying degrees all across the globe. And of course, we've talked about how, you know, they, the deep state or whoever, would be very interested in right. knowing who those people are and and their, you know, their connections to things like 23andMe and Ancestry.com and getting your DNA stuff. Right. Now, recently, 23andMe was hacked. A big, huge hacking, like I think millions of their customers. And I'm one of them um, who, I'm, you know, I, I got my DNA done. So I'm assuming I might be, you know, among the millions whose data was right. stolen. Now, on the surface, you'd say, well, they want to get your credit card data and stuff like that. Uh, okay, but it's intriguing as hell mm-hmm. to wonder what if they want your DNA data? Now, some people could say mm-hmm. for medical fraud or stuff like that, but I, I don't know. It seems interesting to me that somebody hacked into this to get this data from a company that provides people with their DNA. And, and, you know, it makes me wonder who all out there, who among the players wants to possibly identify um, which uh, uh-huh. off world, otherworldly DNA we have to what degree. And that leads to, I've seen another researcher um, ask the question, could there actually still be so-called Nephilim DNA in a lot of humankind right now, man. All right. If you if you press this out, let's assume mm-hmm. that that the watchers were left here to to observe our compliance with the treaty. Mm-hmm. Well, the obvious and most easy way to do that is mm-hmm. for them to move in and amongst us. Right. And. Also, if you want to make very sure that we don't mm-hmm. blow up any more planets, <laughs> the the thing that you would do is try to put your people into positions of influence and power within earthly governments. Mm-hmm. Now let's suppose you're the deep state and you suspect all of this. Mm-hmm. How do you test who is who? The only sure way to do it would be genetically Mm -hmm. and to determine how much uh, human DNA an individual has versus stuff that we don't recognize and so on and so forth. So, you know, this is, this is why I say genetic cousins all the time. Mm -hmm. This is why that one statement that I mentioned in, in uh, SS Brotherhood of the Bell about the Majestic 12 documents and the, the statement of the biologist Detlev Bronk, who was one of the members of MJ-12, is so significant. Because what he says is that we must revisit our models of evolution because 
from what we've seen from these alleged bodies, it would appear that the human life form is something intrinsic to the evolution of organic intelligent life. So what he's telling you there is mm -hmm. if there is intelligent ET, it's going to be humanoid in appearance. So okay. in other words, genetic cousins might mean the genus Homo sapiens mm -hmm. has several different species within it besides Homo sapiens sapiens, us. And we know this already from, from evolutionary studies on Earth. We have Neanderthal man, we have Denisovan man, and these are all cousins genetically to us. They're very mm -hmm. clearly intelligent. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to trace this activity, what do you do? You set up programs where people voluntarily give you their DNA. Voila, problem solved. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and the other thing that this this um, crazy hypothesis does, I think, uh, ex have some explanatory power, is we're watching Western governments go absolutely, pardon my French here, batshit crazy. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. How do we explain this other than, you know, there's there's obvious spiritual explanations. These people are evil and they've lost their minds. I think that's a strong possibility. But sure, the other yeah. possibility is these people quite literally are not us. And they are pursuing their own agenda for their own purposes. Humanity be damned. And, you know, True. here we are. <laughs> I'm really entertain it. Well, you know, it, it you start thinking things like, okay, there was Neanderthal men, and then, um, you know, then after that, uh, well, you get to Homo sapiens sapiens, mm -hmm. um, and and this some will say, oh, that's heretical. I'm just throwing it out there as an intellectual exercise question. What if Homo sapiens sapiens um, is a result of these watchers? What if the whole thing about the watchers mixing that up? is a metaphor for them uh, uh, messing with and developing us um, through our DNA and such, mixing with their own. And what if Homo, homo sapiens sapiens is the product of Well, I don't, you watchers? know, here's the problem. I don't have any problem with that. If you're mm -hmm. going to entertain the idea that angels and demons can assume human appearance why do we have to assume that it's only the evil beings that Thank that you. experimented genetically and so on? That's mm -hmm. certainly true. And there is certainly a, a textual, not just biblical, but certainly a textual tradition mm -hmm. that suggests that the result of these experiments, at least in that case, was the creation of an evil chimerical creature. But what's to say that the good guys were involved in the same process too? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. um, it, it seems fairly clear to me that that's a possibility that, that it, you can't exclude. I think genetics um, would be a good um, sure. way to invade another world. Sure. Um, you know, just... Uh, a la invasion of the body snatchers and you, you know um you come in and you 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 mix with the beings that are there to right. where you they become you so you're already there it's like at the end of ray bradbury's martian chronicles when the character takes his family and they're looking at the uh canal the reflection of themselves and the the sun asks what what happened to the martians or, we are the martians or you yeah. can concoct a completely false plague require everybody to go out and get experimental quack scenes hmm. that modify your DNA and by the way chances are kill you eventually it almost killed me <laughs> well yeah i know that's why <laughs> You know, the, these people mm. are just nuts enough to do something like that. Yeah. Especially if their Hochklaus von Bloschwab Freiherr Bloviation decides that it, his World Economic Conference needs to make contact with some of these beings. You know, these people are stupid enough to follow whatever they'd be told. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah. I, I don't put anything <laughs> anymore, Walter. I, I'm not hedging any of my bets. <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, and, and then there's the whole AI issue, which yep. I think, here, here's an, a way to look at it. The whole thing we're doing with AI um, could be, you know, the kids, you know, instead of giving the Ferrari to, drive around given the the laboratory right. to to fool right. with uh the the kids start mimicking what the watcher geneticist yes. did but yes. they start mimicking it with material technology yes yeah you know so that might be and when you think of the um like you say they can take they can uh take any shape they can shape shift. Right. They can take any form. Uh, I think of the fairy folk, the Tuatha Dé Danann, and their glamoury. That's the same thing. I think the Tuatha are among the Watchers myself. But um, uh, it it it's it's really just um, it's like that. You can create these. Um, you know, it started with the whole idea of the realistic holograms, right? Yes. You could go to a concert and see a dead performer up there, and there he is alive. Uh, somebody did it with Michael Jackson. I think it was done with Tupac Shakur, and it's been done in the popular, you know, Western pop music uh, vein. But um, and then of course we had the uh, uh, what was it? Operation Blue? Was it Bluebird Blue or Bluebeam? Blue yes, I'm sorry, Bluebeam. Which you know, um, so. It it's the AI now that you're seeing people do. Um, we're talking. I, I I don't think it's going to be long till we start seeing um, Vokasan's uh, bleeding man type stuff being done. For instance, with these right now, it's a big joke. Everybody laughs, but the whole thing about these lifelike sex dolls. Well, they're getting those things so realistic that. How long is it going to be before somebody does again a bleeding man thing and and transfer an actual human consciousness into one of those those figures? If if it's possible, I have my doubts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have my doubts. However, I I think that the possibility exists to counterfeit such an effort fairly okay. easily. Yeah. Um there will be there will be ultimately little tells mm-hmm. that will distinguish the real from the fake. But um let me give you an example of what I'm what I'm trying to suggest there. Mm-hmm. Um you know that Catherine Fitz and I do, you know, every three months we do her quarterly wrap ups for her website. And yes. We have we have talked for years um, about why sometimes the the equities markets make no sense whatsoever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, there, there's just there's no rhyme or reason why certain stocks keep going up when and and for that matter the the economy when we're not producing anything. We're right. producing more financial instruments. But that's about yeah. it. God help yeah. us if we get into a war with Russia. You know, <laughs> I, I just yeah. I think that's I think that's about the nuttiest project anybody uh, has. Uh, has we're nearly we're nearly pure consumerism, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I can't think of anything we manufacture off the top of my head. You know, on a wide when the u.s army in its entirety has about a week's worth of artillery ammunition that's that's a pretty bad state of affairs but anyway especially if you're talking about going to war with russia as some people are right now but here's the thing the markets make no sense because since the 1980s what what most trading has has been going on forget about those old pictures of all these stockbrokers on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange waving papers around, mm-hmm. most of that is gone. That's just for show. Most of the trading is done by computers automatically on algorithms, and the computers have to be physically close to the exchange that they're trading on because trades can be ex- executed and 
uh, closed within nanoseconds. So mm-hmm. literally, you're cutting down on the time on the nanoseconds that the speed of light can trade with these other computers. Stop and think about that. That means that the vast volume of trade right now is not being reflective of human analysis and human pricing and human risk assessment. It's a Hmm. computer and it's a program. Now, folks, what that means in effect is that the markets are not reflective of human assessment and of human conditions. That's what it means. And if the markets are that way, if the markets are that way, you can rest assured that virtually every policy decision being made by major governments in the world is being gamed out on computers, and the leaders are simply being following whatever instructions the computer scenario tells them to follow. That's how bad I think it is. So... The, the the computer, so to speak, in general sense, is is our the the product of uh, mankind. It's our nephilim, so to speak. Yes. It's our monster that we yes. have created. Yes, yeah, that's going to eat us alive if we let it. Trust me, it will. Trust yeah. me, it will. It will. Wow. wow. If you if you Walter Bosley are going to invest a hundred thousand dollars in let's say the stock market, and you're going to pick. Stocks. Do you want the computer to do that for you, or do you want to have the final say in assessing the price and the risk? Sure. Of the exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's not being done. <laughs> oh well, it, it's similar. It, it's just like they've gotten us used to, you know, these home computers. They've gotten us used to um, the 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 guys who design the software, the guys right. who who work at the companies. They've gotten right. us used to them deciding what's best right. for our computers. They decide what I need in a uh, word processing uh, program. Right. They decide that I should have to access it online and not own the physical medium. They decide, you know, this, that, so, and the other because they know better than me. So let's go back now to yeah. Enoch and the watchers. Yes. If you're if you're if you're deciding if you're putting into place a monitoring situation like the watchers to monitor mm-hmm. these little monkeys down here on this planet so that mm-hmm. they don't create another situation where they're going to blow up somebody else's planet mm-hmm. then wouldn't one of the things you'd want to do is assume some sort of power and control over the monkey's machines, especially their computers? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. you betcha. It's, it's the governor, um, the speed Bingo. governor on vehicles in other parts of the world. We don't have them here. We could exactly. use them here in the States. But yeah, and what, it's, it's the and governor. What, and what did Elon Musk warn us about artificial intelligence? Well, he was worried that if we did this, somehow that artificial intelligence might wake up or bring in, was his words, bring in another entity or entities. And I guarantee you, I think that that scenario is in play. I think it's been in play for a very long time, as a matter of fact. So, yeah, yeah I... Kind um, of like kind of like um, an otherworldly promise software. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. I wonder to what extent we um, engineer very secretly um, a backdoor for off world uh, participants or entities. Um, no, oh, listen, it, Walter. What? I, 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 I ding, 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 ding. Off my hat. That's hmm. precisely my worry. That is precisely my worry. Uh, I think I think we're playing around. Number one, we're playing around with systems that we really have no long-term experience with. Right. And as a result, we're not only opening ourselves up to the possibility, like we did with Promise, of creating backdoors in a system which may have already had backdoors in it by the mm-hmm. program developer. If you know, if you know that story in detail. But what if someone else was involved, not even from or on this planet or from this 
this species of life we call human? What if someone else was able to insert back doors into those things? Right. And since you mentioned it earlier about UFOs visiting our defense sites, let's remember what happened at some of those bases, missile bases in Montana and Wyoming, where the UFO was able to enter the programming of flights of ICBMs and change the targeting data. Mm -hmm. Now, and by the way, there's rumors now coming out that they did the same thing to the Soviet Union with that flight of missiles in Bielokorovitsia in the Ukraine. Mm. So if you're a Soviet or American military man, and all of a sudden you're getting reports of UFOs changing the targeting data in your ICBMs, is that time to push the red oh shit button? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. It's like, oh yikes. Yeah, um, oh yikes indeed. Yeah, the game the game I was in, you know, with um uh uh double agent operations, I I remember I was sitting at my desk one day. This is when I was at Wright Pat was in the Air Force, was mm -hmm. I? And I remember thinking, my God, the double <laughs> agent program, the double agent program would be it's a perfect um, method or, or avenue, whatever I'm trying to say, um, conduit to actually do technology transfer. Let's say right. the United States says, okay, we need to share this with the Russians. How do we get it to them without overtly getting it to them? Let's use the DA ops, um, yeah. avenue. Let's have our agents put it in the, um, the passage material yeah. and, um, you know, a bunch of real stuff because, you know, as an agent, you're told there's going to be real stuff in there sure. and just slightly, you know, different things. That's not real. That's not accurate. That's not the latest. And, um, you, you know, this is what you're going to use to, to sniff out those pesky, um, GRU guys and see what technology <laughs> the Russian blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting there thinking, boy, it'd be easy for them to just have us believe we were fighting the cause and really yep. we're just giving the Russians stuff. Yeah, we're just that, passing uh, technology back. Yeah, that somebody at the Pentagon knows what's really going on. And I'll be honest with you, that was the moment that I began really psycho-emotionally inside myself moving towards my next career move because yeah. that was the moment that I realized, wait a minute, if I'm just being used for that game – and it, this is not legit. Right. I don't want to be here anymore. On to the next thing, right. which I, I then that, and then, you know, a few years later, there I am standing on top of the ziggurat of Ur in Iraq, thinking much the same thing. Same thing. Golly, what are we really here for? It's yeah. not, <laughs> it's not the reason I came. I want to get out of here, you know? Yeah. So, I don't, uh, I don't have, look, I don't have any problem. <laughs> I don't have any problem that there is some sort of, extraterrestrial intelligence double agent you know hall of mirrors game going on and i'll tell right. you why look at all the contactee stories and all the mm -hmm. abductee stories out there okay. Every last one of them has some weird little thing. You know, Whitley Strieber being you know the most famous case in point. Here's a guy who actually has one of those little implants and, you know, talk about a way to monitor somebody. Yeah, oh, of course. You know, it, it, and, again, it's, it's, it's always cases that seem to, to hover around people that have some sort of family connection with the military. So could this game be going on? Sure. I don't the, have any the, problem with it. The man who trained me in remote viewing, coordinate remote viewing, CRV, um, uh, such as he called it. He was somebody, a guy named Jeff Harvey, mm -hmm. and um, he ended up being on uh, the show Alien Hunters. Mm -hmm. And he invited me to be there when they were filming his episode. And one of the things, he was one of the people that Roger Lear, the Dr. Lear, uh, um, attempted to remove an implant. Right. And I, I saw the, the scans of it. This guy really did have this weird little piece of metal in his leg. And he was one of the ones where it, um, it would not let Dr. Lear, he had a hard time gripping it. Gripping to, it, yes. To pull it out. And one of the techies there, they did the, the thing. And I, I was there when 
they were talking about this and, and he had some type of scanner and what he picked up was, um, this thing picked up a frequency that was only used by NASA. <laughs> and anyway, Jeff's no longer with us. He died of heavy metal poisoning in his blood. Oh, that wow. He tried fighting and, and ultimately wasn't, wasn't able to fight, but um, he oh, had wow. been, he had been a Navy guy, Navy Intel, I and mean, he had contacted me out of the blue. It was, that, that's a whole other story. You know, it was odd, but, um, you know, so um, this, um, I lost my connecting point to that. <laughs> uh, but, but the, the, oh, we're talking about the double agentry aspect and the, the, you know, the, the doing things through people, you know, like you say, with, with the UFO cases, with the, with the people with implants, you know, like you were right. talking about Whitley Streeter right. having the implant, it, you know, it'd be very easy for um, communication, control. Sure. Um, and you know, what's interesting, we're talking about you, you going back to the uh, book of Enoch, you mentioned Whitley Strieber and the, how in the book, it talks about how the, the souls of the dead inhabit that region between earth and the moon. Right. 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 And then you have Ann Strieber, Whitley's right. wife, famously telling him before she passed some years back that this whole UFO mystery has something to do with what we call death. Yes. Wow. There's kind of a connection to the Book of Enoch and what's in there. Well, remember astronauts and cosmonauts mm -hmm. uh, reporting that they've seen their dead loved ones when they're, you know, up there in space. Um, I, who knows? Uh, I, I, that's I have... that's what the famous Russian uh, film Solaris and the novel Solaris right. is about, which was then made into uh, two mm -hmm. movies here. Yes. Uh, same idea. Yeah, I, you know, I don't have any problem with all of this being interconnected. And again, the main reason why is when you examine all those ancient texts, that's what they tell you. <laughs> you know? So why should we be surprised at all of this? Um, I, it, it boggles my mind. You know, the, the modern mind was, has, has been so indoctrinated with materialism that you know mm -hmm. things things that seem crazy to us you know a thousand two thousand years ago wouldn't have been all that crazy to people back then because they, right. they lived with it well i think i think the uh, the materialist crowd um they have their their little barking lap dogs we call them trolls True. And uh, skeptic yes. societies <laughs> and um you know they're just dedicated to you know, just bark loud enough and you'll either shut the people up who are talking about what we don't want them talking about, you know, or, or you'll, you'll divert people's attention away from them or something. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think they're, and then the rest of the materialists are just people who I think, I think they have trouble with these concepts. I think they yes. fear yeah. the things that aren't material. And that's why they cling to the material so yeah. tightly is deep down inside, they're afraid of these other things being real. Yeah, they are. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Their mission in life is to be the fingernails scraping on the blackboard. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're designed to be a gigantic distraction. Exactly. And, you know, exactly. I've, I don't have much time for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I like. I have. Uh, I generally have a zero tolerance for trolls. For example, here, here in, in my <laughs> live chat. You know, they, they've had their day. In my opinion, you know, in this this internet world and stuff, they had their time where they were pretty much really uh, controlling a lot of things through what they do. And I think people now are used to them. They get what they're about, and they realize, okay, these guys don't have the answers either. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, they just don't want to hear other people speculate about you know aspects of the answers. But bringing it back to um, the watchers, some people have brought up the possibility that uh, um, beings like this are just um, people from the future, uh -huh. you know, coming back to maybe fix things, adjust things. You know, what do you think about that? About future travel. Well, about, <laughs> about not, say, the Watchers. Let's say the Watchers, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, some, what if some of them or, or beings like them were just, say, us from our own future coming back to make adjustments? 
Well, I don't, you know, I don't know about that. Um, you know, it, it's certainly possible. My suspicion would be rather that that's that's probably over overly complexifying a scenario that doesn't need to be. And the reason why okay. is that if, let's go back to the plasma life hypothesis and these mm -hmm. enormous plasma structures in the universe that okay. look that look like neurons and synapses. Well, I mean, let's be honest. That's what they look like. And that means it's, it's very possible that that may be what they are. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. That, that you and I are not bits of broken off consciousness, not parts of a greater whole. We are whole ourselves in our, yes. in our existence. Yeah. But at the same time, we can, by that same parity of reasoning, we can also be within and part of a much larger consciousness, just like our own organic sure. existence contains billions and billions of living creatures that call our body home. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and who's to say that they're not conscious in some in some form or fashion? So I don't have any problem with all of this. I'm a I'm a both and kind of guy, not an either or kind of guy. <laughs> but, but well, it, anyway. it's it's the, another way to uh, you know explain it for folks too is is Bluetooth. Now right. we each have our own set of ears that we are born with, right? Organically, right? But with the headphones and and actually with my um expensive hearing aids i have five thousand dollar pair of hearing aids uh which um my insurance covered i certainly didn't have the money to buy those but um they have a bluetooth function these headphones right. have a bluetooth function and right. with that function i connect to the larger consciousness which right. is this computer system right? right it's it's a similar i don't know metaphor or example or whatever uh, of that and um that means that both can be true we are an individual whole in ourselves but at the same time we can as you just said plug into right the, co the collective so to speak right and um, i think that's what i think that's possibly what may be going on with phenomena that people experience that suggest to them that they're reincarnated or that they're having a vision of the future that what they're really tapping into is a consciousness a an a another conscious entity that has at that past and future experience already present as part of their consciousness in other words mm -hmm. you're dealing you're dealing with a being that uh to us seems hyperdimensional and therefore right. that they have they have this kind of con that I, I think I think that we have to entertain that hypothesis as well if we're going to mm -hmm. entertain a, a plasma life hypothesis. So you know it could be it could be any one of these things, any one of these speculations. I think you have to hold open um, your your speculation simply because we're at the cusp. We're at the beginning mm -hmm. of understanding these things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's only been a century since quantum mechanics brought home with full philosophical force that physics cannot ignore the role of the observer any longer, cannot do it. Right. And once that happened, the whole scientific world it's taken a long time for people to realize the philosophical earthquake that that means and we're just at the beginning of it 100 mm -hmm. years when you consider that 100 years with the whole thousands of years of developments going back to thales in ancient classical greece that many people attribute is really kind of the beginning of modern science uh, and if not longer, if you if you don't accept that quackademic model, uh, which I don't, <laughs> I think I think science is much older than that. But my point is, we're dealing with just a speck. So we're on the cusp of things that eventually, I think, if we if we have a science of consciousness 
that is able to emerge from all of this, it's going to point the way between all of these different hypotheses, um, which we don't have right now. You know, let's be honest, we don't have it. Hmm. So I, you know, I, I don't know where it's going to go. Now, personally, I'm not a believer in reincarnation. I never have been. I think there right. are other, I think there are other ways, but as a hypothesis, for entertaining, you know, what, how do we explain all these different things? I don't think you can close the door on it from a scientific point of view because we simply don't know enough about right. this stuff. We, we just don't. Um, well, if that you know, offends on, people, too bad. <laughs> you know, on, on the reincarnation model, for the longest time, I've thought that, um, I've wondered, you know, if we can inherit. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at uh, photos or paintings of people in a family line, and right. many of them look astonishingly alike. If we yes. can inherit yes. physical likeness, if we can inherit hair color, eye color, and these things, if you we can, can inherit, inherit medical memory. conditions, yeah. exactly, yeah. we've got to be able to inherit memory. And maybe yeah. that's where people are thinking they're confusing that with reincarnation. Well, I and think, yeah, I think, I think genetic memory. You know, I've said this for many years. I think genetic genetic memory has a is a strong component of this mm -hmm. but even there what we're dealing with 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 genetic memory is you know i as i get older something weird is happening to me and, and maybe other people have had this experience as well uh in my from my 20s to my early 40s i looked very very much like my father mm-hmm I mean, you know, my mannerisms, everything was very much like my father. Mm -hmm. As I get into my 60s, my physiology looks more like my my maternal grandfather. My grandfather has right. It. Yeah. And I you know, I miss it. I look in the mirror and I see Ray Hazlitt. <laughs> <You> yeah. <know? laughs> I don't see Max Farrell. So, you know, whatever's going on with me is, again, it's some sort of memory that we have mm -hmm. just simply by dint of our genetics. And, and I, I, I defy anybody to tell me that it does not affect the way I think. Oh, of course. You know, it you know, would. I think it does. Yeah, of course it does. It should. It should. What I think when we talk about this is my first thought is, ooh, how do I tap into that and explore those genetic memories? How do I Bingo. go back, back in my line, 250 years and right. in some way see what my ancestors, you know, uh, well, it was more than 250 because they came over here to the Americas in the 17th century, a hundred years right. before the revolution. I, you know, I, how could I tap into that to see places in Scotland that I, oh, Walter I think, Bosley, I think, have never been to, but my ancestors came from. I, I think there's something there, too, because virtually every religion that that is on this planet, you mm -hmm. know, including Eastern Orthodox, I can point out uh, prayers for your departed relatives from, from my service books. Virtually mm -hmm. every religion on this planet has some sort of veneration for your departed relatives mm -hmm. from confucianism to russian orthodoxy to strains of islam judaism you name it uh there's there's this reverence or or honor that is paid to your departed relatives and the question is why where is is that just pious you know is it just because you want to be i think it's something deeper i don't know why but mm -hmm. I think it's coming out of something deeper. Uh, and again, I, I think it's coming out of this idea that, that there may be something with genetic memory that this is supposed to put you into touch with. Right. Uh, I, I, I don't know how else to explain it. Well, you know, on this, uh, it, uh, there's another question that I think leads to another different conversation mm -hmm. that uh, it, we, we in this physical life we inherit genetic memories, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I'm one of those. And I think you are too, um, that, uh, after the body dies, it doesn't mean we die. Of course, no, I don't think so. another form of existence. Uh, you know, what's interesting is, uh, do we meet 
you know, do we have the opportunity to meet those past family members whose memories we've inherited? And is there any kind of input that you can, as one of the dead, um, influence someone who's in your bloodline? You know, like a oh, grandchild wow. yeah. from the uh, land of the dead, so to speak. Well, that that's difficult. Um, there are all sorts of of traditions and and people that have you know have near death experiences that say that they've seen their departed relatives. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have been personally present at someone's bedside when they died and literally they sat up and and were talking with people at the end of their bed that yeah. were not there <laughs> okay right. yeah. uh, but it was it was so um uncannily real yeah so you know who's to say i don't know I, again, I think this has something to do with this whole plasma life hypothesis because mm-hmm. part of our our corporeality, mm-hmm. our our bodily existence, is and this this has come out in the last twenty years is every one of us has a kind of a bioplasma cloud that extends for about six feet beyond our body. Mm-hmm. And that cloud is absolutely unique to us as individuals. So in other words, there is a part of us that's not even trapped inside this sack of water. Right. (laughs) Right. It it extends. It extends me. What, you know, what's that? Yeah. My, (laughs) my, my first big, well, my biggest experience with seeing the aura or this mm-hmm. was, I, I, I was on a, uh, one of the, I was on an undercover squad in Manhattan as a Russian translator. And we were having a, a, a squad meeting because we had had a visitor from uh, MI6 from mm-hmm. England uh, come over. And as she was sitting at the, the table, the room's full of agents and uh, specialists and stuff. She's talking, telling us about, you know, the, the, Pro, blah 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 counterintelligence world stuff, and I'm sitting there, and I'm seeing just off of her, no one else. I'm seeing this green emanation, and I, I remember standing there, and I know my eyes got wide as I'm, and I'm looking around, and I'm not seeing this off of anyone else but her. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm trying to be low key because <laughs> I don't want anyone else to say. So look at Walter, what's going on with him? You know, cause it's an FBI thing, you know, don't want him to think I'm crazy. Right. Although uh-huh. it's those kind of people who taught me the craziest stuff that, <laughs> you know, but um, <laughs> yeah. And it stunned me, Joseph. It, yeah. it was, it was shockingly vivid. Yeah. And, you know, for what I, that's you know, I, I think, I think again, we're at the beginning of all of this and, and, this bioplasmic cloud, Robert Temple brings it out in his book, uh, all that long discussion at the end of his book about this bioplasma cloud. Um, I, I'm willing to go even further and speculate that maybe it's that cloud that is the sense mechanism that we have for mm-hmm. sensing someone else's character. You know, you get around certain hmm. people. Yeah. I know that you know this experience because you've told me about it and yeah. and I've certainly had it as well. You get around certain people and you just feel like this person I don't want to have anything to do with. You can just sense right. the the rottenness. <laughs> you know? yeah. Uh and you just don't want to be in the same room with them. Um, right. And and it's it's a palpable physical reaction, but it's nothing that you're seeing Hearing, touching, tasting. You're sensing it. You're sensing it. Yeah. Like you can't see, I mean, except for weather, but you know, you walk into a room and you feel temperature changes. You don't, you don't always see that. You just walk in and you go, oh, it feels cold because of the reaction of your skin and stuff like that. It's, it's similar to that. It's not, it's the classic, we don't see microwaves, but we know they're there. They're there. You know, kind of thing. So uh, before we go to questions from the Uh live chat, um, uh, do you think therefore that the 
watchers, so to speak, are still with us in some capacity? Well, personally, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, again, I don't see how they can not be, you know, there's, there's, again, I, I go to, I go oftentimes to, to religious tradition, occult and esoteric tradition and so on, because most of those traditions have some idea mm -hmm. or some version of guardian angels and, you know, your own personal tempter and temptations and so on. Yeah. Um, so that's that's really saying simply that that everybody has their own watcher. So if that's the case, the question mm -hmm. is why? Well, if if you are looking at all of this from from the big picture, from this ancient war and this idea that there was an end to that war and a quarantine zone and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Again, it stands to reason that they would want to keep very, very close watch, not just on humanity per se, mm -hmm. but on particular people, particularly those that they have spotted or profiled, to use the modern term, as being a potential threat and so on and so forth. You know, mm -hmm. our own yeah. government does this all the time and, and every government does. So yeah. who, why would they not? Sure. So, yeah, I think I think it goes on all the time. I don't think we've ever been uh, at at any point in human history where they've not watched. I think that we're. I think there are certain periods of history where humanity has obviously not been a big threat, and hence they haven't watched quite as closely. Right. But since World War II, the dawn of the nuclear age, you know, since the electrification of the planet, uh, that's when we dialed things up significantly. And yeah. what do we see as a result? We see all of this strange stuff going on, UFOs and, you know, all of that. Absolutely. Our, our energizing, electrifying and nuclefying the, yep. uh, the planet, that that made us register on their aura, so to speak. Absolutely, it did. Absolutely, it did. Yeah. So, well, hey, let's go to the live chat for questions, folks. Um, you, you, I, I usually ask this. You stand a better chance to have your comment addressed or your question answered if you put it in all caps. So please, all caps. And the first comment we have here to address, Marcus Toledo says, Joseph, have you looked up the book by James Blish, The Star Dwellers? Uh, no, Marcus, I have not. I, in fact, this is the first time I've heard of it, but I will, I will do so, um, since you bring it to my attention. And VKK, Joseph, is there a connection between Tiamat and the demon in the Echor? Oh yeah. Yeah. You betcha. Um, basically if, if, as I suspect the great pyramid was a weapon, number one, Mm -hmm. And number two, it played some role in the destruction of the planet and our solar system, Tiamat. Uh, and if that if that structure was at some time a dwelling place or a a seat of authority or other physical uh, attachment to some sort of demonic entity, yeah, there is a connection between it and Tiamat. I mean. You have to be pretty demonic to blow up a planet. Yeah. I you know, I, I don't think Joseph Stalin in his wildest fantasies would would dream of doing something that monstrous. I may be wrong because the guy was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. But you know, even even our worst characters have these weird sorts of limits as to how far they're gonna go. Um so, yeah, uh, you'd have to be a pretty demonic entity to do something like that. Uh, certainly, uh, or, or possessed by one, you know. So or possessed speak. by one, yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't have which Which problems. ideas, ideas can, can, can uh, serve the same function as an uh, evil absolutely. that possesses someone, you know. Yeah, now, I have no problem de believing that Stalin was possessed in that sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Met Meti Oxoy, Joseph, do you have any information about pyramid and underground ancient bases in Romania? Uh, no, I don't, Mete, but um, 
I do think it's very interesting that the closer we look at the surface of this planet and the more we explore things that at first glance may look like natural features and then come to discover they're not, I'm not mm. at all surprised that there might be such features in Romania uh, for a variety of reasons, but I, I have not personally investigated nor looked into them, so I don't know anything about them right off the top of my head at present. Kim Thomas, if humanity is evolving in individuation of self, wouldn't family memory access be a step backwards? No, not at all. No, You're, I don't think so. Wisdom, wisdom. Yeah. But go ahead, Joseph, you, you address that. Well, I'm, I'm in the same boat, Walter. I, I, think, I think the first thing that hurts you is when you throw out history and memory. I mean, let's, yep. I mean, Kim, take, take your proposition to its ultimate logical extreme. If you were to get or banish all memory, you would have to relearn everything every 20 years. And the fact of the matter is we build on human memory and history. So, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel with every generation. We don't have to reinvent electricity with every generation because we have memory. We have history. Um, um, slave masters want you to disregard history. They yes. don't want you to know the past. Um, yep. You know, and and people who are trying to control a narrative, especially, you yep. know, don't want you to know history. Look at, look at ufology today. Right now... <laughs> That's being run, and the the people that are just the loudest, craziest voices, um, uh, most of them know nothing about ufology history. And what's the downside to that? Well, they don't know they're being duped in a way that others have been duped before. They Stop they believe my hat, Walter. Here, they here. believe. Yeah, they believe the Bob Lazar story is true because <laughs> they don't know the past and how it was proven to be nonsense. They still believe Roswell had to be an ET event because <laughs> they refuse. They either don't know what you know has been uncovered about it in the last twenty some years, or they just want to ignore it because it doesn't fit in with what they want to believe. And when you when you plug in what you want to believe in place of history and in what actually was you're setting yourself up for oh here uh, here i walter i'm so glad to hear you I, I have to throw in my two cents folks and say you need to listen to walter here because i i have the same impression it's like they have tried to completely reinvent ufology whole cloth in the last five years and yeah. it's like donald kehoe and Frank Edwards and all of those ufologists from the 50s and 60s and 70s never even existed. Right. And to right. me, it's entire it's it's completely frustrating. It's like it's like we've thrown out Darwin and we're gonna reinvent biology all over again. Yeah. It's nuts. Right, totally right. Nuts. You, you know, folks, Lou Elizondo is not your friend. David no, Grush not. is not your friend. Um, <laughs> no, he doesn't. Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy Corbell, the carnival barker, is not your friend, okay? Yeah. And throw in his buddy George Knapp. Um, these people are not <laughs> giving you the truth. They are not doing anything to move the ball forward, so to speak. No, okay? they're, they're uh, really not. It, Greer, it's... he's full of crap, too, and... Um, you know, uh, but I'm going to get a lot of crap for this. I'm going to get a lot of trolls for the next week, but I don't care. Um. <laughs> I, listen, I, I, I'm with you there, Walter. I, I'm just, I am as perplexed as I can be as, as to what I see going on in, in ufology. It's just, it boggles my mind. And listen, yeah. I'll go further, Walter, and I think mm -hmm. maybe you might concur with this observation. I don't know. Yeah. So I'm going to toss it out there to see what your reaction is. Have you noticed that most of this activity in trying to completely reinvent ufology has happened since the last Secret Space Program conference? Yep. Yeah. I have noticed that and I yeah. I've said stuff about that before. Yeah. Um yeah. I I think that as I've said in the past, I'll say it again because there's new folks here. Um uh uh we scare we, 
yes, you scared them. You guys were getting way too close to the truth. Yeah. Um, and after 2015, they decided drastic measures need to be taken. Yep. So I, I think I think that's why Corey Good was allowed to happen yep. um, and encouraged. And then after him, that's why Lou and TTSA was forced yep. on us. That's why Grush and that's why, you know, whoever is pushing Corbell, you know, to push what he pushes. It was all about gaining control of the narrative and steering it away from yep. the legitimate secret space program yep. research. Yeah, absolutely. Here, here. Okay, here, here. let me go back up here to stuff that um, people are asking. Um, action faction, just like how they change the words in hopes of obscuring meaning. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Change the lexicon. D. Dorothy Papineau, worlds in collision. If one is heading at you, don't have to be evil to shoot. Well, yeah, you're defending yourself there, right? True, but the problem yeah. is um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not a I'm not a subscriber to the Velikovskian version of of catastrophism. I don't oh. think I don't think that Tiamat was headed on a collision course with Earth. Right, there's a little bit more of an intent behind yeah, what happened. To Tiamat. Definitely intent. Okay, so we have uh, Mete Aksoy. Joseph, what do you think about Karen Hootie's homo capensis <laughs> theory? Is there any connection to the Watchers? Um, okay. I don't know anything about Karen Hootie's theory about homo capensis. I didn't even know that she had such a theory. Uh, if it's the same Karen Hudis that I'm thinking of, she also a few years ago had many sorts of theories about what was going on financially. Uh, she tried to contact me and get me on board with some of her theories, and I just I took one look at what she was proposing, and I said no. So it, take that for whatever it's worth to you. Uh, VKK, if the Earth's axis changes position to point to the original star, will the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, I'm assuming, be activated? No. No. Uh, you, you have to familiarize yourself with my theory as I've outlined it in my books. Once you're familiar with the theory, you'll realize that it is virtually impossible to reactivate the structure now. And the, the basic reason why is that the structure is missing internal components, not to mention its case. Right. Notes. Right. Right. That's like uh, what I say about my Disneyland hypothesis. They right. moved, they right. moved the apparatus. They moved right. the carousel from the position it needed to be in for it to work. Right. The yeah. Great Pyramid, there's clearly apparatuses that are no longer there. No that longer there. Necessary. Yeah. So let's go to beaches to mountains. What's Joseph's thoughts on how far <laughs> our secret government tech has really progressed? You know, beaches originally. That's a very good question. Originally, my um, window, so to speak, of how far the technology progressed. When I started this research, I was willing to maintain about 10 to 20 years. The, about 10 years ago, I, I came to the conclusion, no, it's it's probably half a century beyond what, what we think of now. Um and what turned my what turned my opinion there, Beaches, was DARPA's pronouncement uh, about ten years ago that they wanted this country, the United States, to be warp capable in a century. In other words, Star Trek in a century. Stop and stop and let that one really sink in. That they were that confident to make that kind of science and technology goal. And the reason they did, incidentally, was because a NASA scientist by the name of Dr. Uh, Harold White, and his nickname is Sonny, mm -hmm. had redone the calculations in a Mexican physicist by the name of Miguel Alcubierre, who had published a paper in uh, a physics journal about warp drive and 
the metric, the 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 amount of energy needed to warp a a unit of space time, so to speak, was a mass energy equivalent to the planet Jupiter. In other words, you'd have to take the entire planet Jupiter and convert it to energy in order to be able to warp that one unit of space. And that, of course, is beyond our capability wildly. Hmm. What Dr. White did is he recomputed that calculation and discovered that it was nowhere near that amount of a mass energy conversion necessary to warp a unit of space. And the energy that he came up with was within human possibility. So DARPA immediately set that goal. So I thought, okay, if this is the case, and if this is what they're saying publicly, then let's say that the technology is about 50 years ahead. And right about the same time that DARPA and, and, and Dr. White made that calculation and announcement, that was when all the alleged statements of Ben Rich, you know, that we found an error in the equations and now we can take ET home and all this other stuff started to hit the ufology community. Mm -hmm. Now, where I'm at today is, and it's largely due to our friend uh, Walter here, that I'm, I'm willing to entertain it may be as much as a century ahead of, of us. Where, where we are publicly now. Hmm. Um, about the only problem I have with viewing things being that far ahead is the materials science necessary for some of this hmm. has not started hitting publicly until very, very recently. Hmm. Let me give you another example, Beaches. In the original pyramid books, I talk about something at the time I speculated, what I called phi crystals, okay? A crystal whose index of refraction was such that it would trap a photon within the crystal and that the photon would never be able to escape. It would be a crystal that would function effectively like a mini black hole. At the time I first wrote the original pyramid book, I thought that this idea was so nuts, I almost hesitated to mention it. 20 years later, they're actually doing it. They're creating crystals that can effectively function like mini singularities. And once you've said a singularity, what have you said? You've said gravity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how far ahead are they? Who knows? And this, incidentally, again, they're talking and publishing these papers. This is what they're willing to talk about publicly. Okay. Oh, boy. Is the disappearance of MH370 evidence of the breakaway civilization in their power? Oh, boy. I didn't expect to get that one. Um Deman or whatever your name is. Um, when when MH370 first disappeared, and, and Walter, I think, can attest to this, mm -hmm. I went on a show of a mutual friend of ours at the time by the name of George Ann Hughes. This was in a couple of weeks of the disappearance of, of Flight 370. And, of course, there was chatter and every every speculation you can imagine as to what happened to it at the time and on that show i said well my personal view it is that when all other explanation fails you have to entertain the impossible and i said it's entirely possible because none of these other explanations are really you know they're leaking water all over the place so i said the only explanation I can come up with is I think it just went poof. It just disappeared. Hmm. Yep. And I've wavered since then as other explanations have come out that, that mm -hmm. are plausible. I've, I've wavered back and forth, 
uh, the French journalist Florence de Cagny came out with a very good book on the disappearance of Flight 370 that if you're interested in that topic, I heartily recommend you read her book before you go any further because she uncovers a lot of um, intelligence hijinks going on in the background, okay? And incidentally, military exercises. Now, it's in that context that Ashton, what's his name, has come out with that video that apparently shows an airplane, presumably or allegedly uh, MH370, flying into a vortex and just zapping out of existence. And according to his presentations of this, and his allegations that experts have looked at that video and cannot find any evidence of tampering or falsification, that what we have here is a video of the dang thing actually disappearing. So oh. I, I, you know, I've gone back about 50-50 on the it just went poof idea. Wow. Yeah, wow. Infinite Duality asks, any thoughts on Saturn's hexagram at its pole? I find that interesting. What do you think about it? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to toot my horn. <laughs> um, when Richard Hoagland first came out with his idea of tetrahedral physics, this was in the 1980s. I think it was about 1987, 1988. I wrote him an eight-page letter complete with diagrams that if you ortho-rotate, which means you, you rotate 90 degrees perpendicular on all axes, if you ortho-rotate two spherically circumscribed tetrahedra, as he was talking about, mm -hmm. you'll not only get the vertices of each tetrahedra at 19 and a half degrees north or south latitude, those tetrahedra will create a hexagonal figure or shape on the plane of the equator. And because of that hex hexagon at the plane of the equator, being inside a rotating sphere with these ortho-rotated tetrahedra, you should see some sort of hexagonal structure appearing at the poles of any fluidly dynamic planet. Lo and behold, that's what we see on, on Saturn. So in other words, what you see there is the phase space projection of two ortho-rotated tetrahedra inside the planet Saturn. You're looking at a hyperdimensional effect. Yeah. Uh, a. Hamilton, 747, did anyone mention the Dark Knight of presumably the Black Knight satellite yet. No, we haven't mentioned that. Um, I will just say this. The popular photograph of the weird-looking object with the, the pointy end um, that looks like a beak, that has sufficiently proven to be just um, NASA debris. Um, there's huh. been a, a, a very clear presentation on that. That thing there that famous photograph that is nasa debris it is it was some type of shroud that went over something on a satellite and it just got loose or whatever however um there is the lore of the black knight satellite you know the story behind it and the alleged signals and 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 on and so forth but um that, that i just want to share that because a lot of people still bandy about that photograph and they i guess they just don't know it's been let, let me take a quick nature break, Walter. I'll be right back. Sure. Okay. Sure. I will scroll through the uh, live chat here and see if this has been a fantastic um, discussion, I think. Oh, okay. Sam is finally um, rewording his question. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, you know what? It might have been a keyword, as was suggested that uh, we have certain things that we just, you know, don't go there. Um, Splash has a question coming up. There's Sam's question. And Sam, what I meant by that is we have had people that uh, that was how they trolled us. They said, you're not asking my question. You're not. And they've net and they never post a question. So 
everybody in the live chat generally knows, you know, that we have experienced that. Well, the regulars, the people who have been around a while are aware of that. So thank you for rewording your question. When Joseph returns, we will get back to um, presenting these questions. And okay. So now um, if uh, you're interested in um, I thought I had Joseph's Demon in the Acre book. Um, I think that's available at Amazon. That's his, his latest book. And that's published by Adventures Unlimited Press. So make sure you go to Amazon and look for that okay. book, Joseph's book. So, okay, Joseph. I apologize. Uh, Ever since the heart attack, they've had me on all these medicines that make me pee like a Russian weightlifter <laughs> at an Olympic game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Splash asks, can Joseph explain some of the significance in Enoch not experiencing a natural death and instead being taken up to be with God? Um, well, in terms of, in terms of, of its literary significance, you've, you've got references to that sort of thing in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha and so on. Um, in terms of the text and the, the cosmology that's being suggested there, my suspicion, and it's splash, it's only a suspicion because I'm not a I'm not much of a literary critic or things like that, but my suspicion is that at least in some places in both versions of the book of Enoch, you're looking at kind of a stylized um, a stylized Hellenized um, Jewishized version of the Egyptian wisdom god Tehuda, and that Tehuda is being shown around kind of uh, in heaven, and therefore he's as a god or a, a kind of demigod figure, he's not capable of death. That's a guess, and mm. it's it's a very poor guess uh, at this juncture. I hope that helps. Um. Sam had a little trouble getting his question to show up, so he had to word it oddly. Uh, please discuss green mist beings of light, the watchers measuring the... It, could that be the watchers measuring the deep? I'm not familiar with the green mist beings I, of light. I'm not either. I'm not either, Sam. You'd have to give me a little bit more information. Sam, give us, a, give us a source on that so that we can... Because uh, I'm intrigued. I'd like to learn more about that if there's a book out there or, or something. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with what you're talking about. Matty S., do you think that Michael Cremo's view of... What do you think of Michael Cremo's view of human devolution? Meaning well, I, we were more advanced in the past. and Oh, I, I, I adhere to that view. Um, and incidentally, I... Uh, I have a great deal of respect for the Vedic cosmology in the sense that I think humanity is far older than the modern quackademic view, or for that matter, the, the modern Western religious view holds. Um, you know, there's that whole business with Archbishop Usher trying to total up the lengths of time of people's lives in the old testament and coming up with the idea that you know the earth is four thousand years old or you get seven thousand years in the jewish calendar and so on and so forth the problem with with biblical numbers as any biblical scholar will tell you is that the numbers themselves seem to be symbolic number one and number two oftentimes they are they appear to be deliberately shortened from, you know, from spans of millions down to thousands. You know, they just lop off a bunch of zeros in order to talk about them. So I, I have a great deal of respect for Vedic cosmology and particularly for the view that there was a high civilization at some point and we've declined uh, hmm. since then. Yeah. 
here here's an interesting question from Olive Eisner. What uh-huh. about the, the the Black Knight satellite? Is it related to the quarantine or 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 the watchers? And I find that intriguing because um, it could be. It could be. Yeah, it could be. You know, we're in speculation territory here. Oh yeah. Uh, I I think I think in terms Olive of of speculations of this sort the more comprehensive and all inclusive you can make your scenario of all sorts of anomalous things the better the scenario and the stronger the scenario is so you know i think it's entirely possible with that way of thinking in mind that it could be here's one that it's not in all caps like i always tell people to do but it caught my eye and it intrigues me and it is a good opportunity on my last show, I was talking about Longfellow's tomb, oh, and dear. I mentioned that you were the one that pointed me to it to study it in your in your classically vague, the <laughs> teacher leading the student to an answer way. So here's the question. Ah. Jensen, Walter, will you ask JPF about the tomb you were talking about on your last solo episode? Like, maybe we'll get some more insight as to what the horned tomb, you know, I'm supposed to be seeing about that. <laughs> oh, my Okay, refresh my memory here. Remember, okay, yeah. It, what in, exactly did I tell you about Longfellow's tomb? Um, it, this was in in reference to um, uh, thematic connections to the, um, the the painting, the the three oh. shepherds, known as Et Narcadia Ego, uh-huh. and and all that stuff. And you had said, take a look at Longfellow's tomb. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And uh, particularly, it's it's horned, uh-huh. the horns at the corners, and that was all. That was all you told me that I recall. And what conclusion did you come to? Uh, I don't want to uh, give. You see, this is sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, Gypsy Moon, blame. <laughs> I know, but hey, wait a minute. I'm not about to answer a question <laughs> that sh- that this person's asking that you yourself might be using as a probe. So this is why I'm being a little <laughs> cautious here. Um, okay. Uh, the horned tomb thing, uh-huh. the, the, the farthest I got with that specific feature was that um, maybe some type of uh, symbology or not symbology, maybe more uh, like, like Ark of the Covenant type of technology thing. Um, there's the mystery of... Longfellow's family's bodies having been discovered to not be in their crypt. And it made me wonder if Longfellow's body itself is even in his tomb. Um, And, you know, I'd have to look at my notes because it's a couple of years back. Okay. How to answer this without answering (laughs) is, is the question. Yeah. Um, of course, you know what I've told you. I'm I'm a cousin to Longfellow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Here's here's my next hint. Okay. Good. But it's I, it's nothing more than a hint. Okay. And it's it's a hint that goes to Poussin's painting at an Arcadia Tego, because what did Longfellow write a whole poem about? Uh, Evangeline? One of his, one of, yes, one of his characteristically long-winded, dull, obsequious, romantic screeds of, of so-called poetry. As you can tell, I have no respect for my cousin's literary efforts. But... <laughs> All right. In both cases, there are horns. What do the horns of an altar mean? Why are they there? And I say no more. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Oh, you, uh, the, the one thing you, one thing I believe you suggested to me was the researcher who writes in French about the paintings mm-hmm. and stuff. And I did go, but I'd have to look at my notes to remember off the top of my head. 
what I found there. So thank you, Gypsy Moon. <laughs> and, and we didn't even do this in cahoots. <laughs> that, that was that yeah, I talked sure. about it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, okay, Gypsy Moon. Let me know when you get the check. <laughs> so, um, uh, Michael McCoslin asked Joseph Farrell, "Do you read Proto?" Proto he- no, I do not. Um, I know what you're talking about, Michael, but I do not read it. In fact, uh, my last my last real prolonged exposure <laughs> to, to biblical Hebrew was in college. I would I would absolutely be struggling to read it now, even mm. even in its non proto form. <laughs> Demand asks, Joseph, as per Demon in the Ecker, where are the plasma entities now? Well, exactly where I, I describe them in, in the book. You've mm-hmm. got the Kordolevsky cloud between the Earth and the Moon. You've got the Great Sloan Wall, that gigantic structure. It's still there. It hasn't, it hasn't moved, <laughs> so to speak. They're still there. Exactly where I describe Griffin Eagle 7 says planetary alignment is digital thread data. Uh, I don't understand what, what you're getting at there. So yeah, I, try, I, try to try to rephrase that. Uh, yeah, uh, give us Griffin some Eagle. context. I'm not a mind reader. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, Michael McCausland asked Joseph, do you understand Cliff High's web bot? Do I understand what he, how he's doing it, or what he's doing? No, I don't. All I, all I know is what he has claimed to have constructed an algorithmic search tool based on his uh, time and and um, expertise at Microsoft when he was there, and that he created this thing. As to what it is and how it works, I I, I simply do not know. Uh, it sounds to me like it's an automatic program that is constantly running and pulling things mm. up to him. Oh, okay. Olive Eisner asked, uh, has Dr. Farrell heard of the very, very popular new theory that Enoch is Enki, the Sumerian? Uh, no, I haven't heard it. I'm not surprised that someone would suggest it. Not surprised a bit. Uh Michael McCausland, Cozared Biometrics of the Solari Report. Uh, what about it? I, I don't even know what that is. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Kozarev, maybe. Maybe he meant Kozarev. Kozarev. Um, yeah. Um, well, again, I, I still don't know what Kozarev Biometrics of the Solari Report is supposed to mean. You, if, you know, you got to give me more context to work with there. Um. Juju Judio asks, was Enoch himself a giant? Because the suffix O-C-H-O-C ach, ach means giant or hybrid? I don't know. I don't know. The problem, the problem is you're 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 dealing with a text that's been translated from languages. So we'd have to find out what the original language is. Most likely Greek, but again, we don't know for sure. That's that's the kind of scholarly speculation that they have on the basis of looking at the text. But do they know for certain? No. Um, Olive Eisner, again, I am aware of Dr. Farrell's opinion on FE. He's not all for it. But what to, what does he say to this viral idea of Earth being an AI construct connected to the repeating catastrophe patterns? Opinion on Fay. I don't even know what what you're referring to. Opinion on Fay. Are we talking? Are we talking iron? You know, <laughs> or is it F E? Or yeah, a, a, a little more, a little more detail, Olive, and we can ask that again. Uh, Michael McCoslin with Can the Human Brain Be Used as a Chip to Operate Vimanas? Well. That's getting into that technology that I think the military um, yeah. engineers are pursuing, yeah. right? Um, yeah, I, it's interesting. You're suggesting that there's a biometric component to Vimanos. I don't know that that the Vimanic texts suggest that or not, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there's something in them that, that might suggest that. But that's a guess. Uh, Oswald Spengler asks, have y'all followed up on the Mormon Transhumanist Association research? I'm, I'm doing that. 
I'm doing it. Um, I'm working on a project that directly involves that research. So yes, Oswald, I, I am. Are, yeah, I, I am not familiar with it. And no, I'm not doing anything, any research in it. Oh, I will share that with you. Um, offline okay. here. It's wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, I talked about it. It popped up in a uh, recent. Um, I am not surprised that they would be doing that. I can say that. I'm not at all surprised. Martin Taylor. Joseph, any books in line to follow Ecker? Uh, I'm thinking about two right now. I'm thinking about one that's going to be so wild and weird. I'm I'm hesitant even to write it. Um, I, I it, it's a book I've been puzzling about, and how do I how do I write it? And I I honestly don't know. Um, I have I have the stayed version in my head, and I have the wild, crazy, totally off the end of the twig feral is slated for rubber room sort <laughs> of uh, version in my head and then i have a second one that i am also thinking on doing on a completely different subject uh yes i i can i can vouch for joseph always has another book more oh, than always one. always lined up always <laughs> yes always uh but sam it, it, it has mm -hmm. nothing to do with the subject of demon in the acre neither one do anyway go ahead um, Did you get what Tessa said right before Sam? That is. Well, wait, is it in caps or? No, it's not. Oh, it's the one right before. Right before. Okay, Tessa eleven eleven. Yeah. Yeah. Ask. Um, yeah. That, that. Thank you, Tessa. That's what I was wondering if the horns of his tomb are like the angels cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, that's a hint. But again, <laughs> again, the question is, what are the horns of an altar? What does that okay. refer to? Why are they there? Yeah. Why? That will require some really intense digging. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, uh, here's why it's important. Mm -hmm. If you if you look at the old Roman missiles, in other words, the oops, my my dog is throwing things off the bed. If you look at the old Roman Catholic pre-Vatican II missiles, the Latin missiles, yeah, they will talk about the horns of the altar. Well, if you look at if you look at a Roman Catholic altar, there's no horns on it. So, what does the expression mean? And on those old altars, why are they there? Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. I got that, I got that noted. <laughs> uh, okay. Next question is. Sam is asking, um, there's a phenomenon of the green mist in connection with the five. Ah, uh, the Philadelphia experiment. Okay. Yeah, Philadelphia experiment, whether even magic beings of light being connected with this. My question is if there's a connection with the watchers to that. Okay. Um, speculation here, Sam, entirely. When you see green mist, if you live in, in the Midwestern United States, and you have seen really big thunderstorms come barreling in across the plains. And those thunderstorms have been associated with tornadic activity. And by the way, this has to be in daylight. Oftentimes you will see a green color in the atmosphere accompanying the storm front. Okay. That color is the ion, is an extreme ionization of the atmosphere. That's what it is. Now, all thunderstorms, like it or not, all thunderstorms are in an, in an ionic plasma state, all of them, without exception. The green color is telling you that the ionization is particularly pronounced. And that's when you have the most violent 
electrical and incidentally the most violent tornadic storms. If you're familiar with that green color, that's what it represents. So in the Philadelphia experiment, what the ionization is representing is the ionization of the atmosphere, and that can only occur in the presence of extremely strong electrostatic forces, just like is claimed in the Philadelphia experiment, just like you would have in a thunderstorm. Now, the question then becomes, could that be related to the plasma life hypothesis? Well, yes. Anytime you have a plasma, you might be, please note the subjunctive, you might be dealing with a living entity of some sort. That's why it's unpredictable. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, there, there could be a connection. Would any of that have a connection with the watchers? Possibly, if the watchers are these plasma light forms. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Infinite Duality asks um, your thoughts on the Moses as Akhenaten theory. Oh, boy, that's an interesting question. Wow. <laughs> um, I think it was actually Sigmund Freud that either suggested that or came close to it. He, you know, he wrote Freud's book on, on Moses and connected uh, Moses with the, the so-called heretic Pharaoh. And, and I really think that uh, Freud has not been given the due credit for making that connection. I think he was probably the first. Um, but as to whether or not Moses should be identified with the Pharaoh Akhenaten, that's a different question. My my instincts would be to say no, although I do think you can make a very plausible, strong case that there's some connection of Moses to that particular Pharaoh. Now, interestingly enough, infinite duality, I do talk about that theory in in one of my books. Uh, in in the thrice great Hermetica in the Janus Age, in connection with the the Essene community and in connection with the so-called treasure scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, if you haven't read that that particular book, you might be interested in it. You might also be interested in the research of the British scholar uh, Richard Feather that I base my part of that book on his research. Uh, I think you'll find it fascinating. Uh, Marcus Toledo says, by the way, James Blish's novel was written for juveniles or young readers. So maybe that's why I'm not familiar with it, but it would be. Hey, I read comic books. So Hey, yeah. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you, uh, Slow Time, for that uh, generous $10 super chat. And I didn't get to thank... Uh, I threw it up on the screen, but thank you, Malia Grimm, for your $5 super chat. Much appreciated. And uh, Philip Blair, there's a theory that Saturn's moon that looks like the Death Star. That's is home to, Yeah. I, oh, that's right. Iapetus is home to some sort of sinister base of fallen angels. What do you make of this theory? That's yeah. an interesting moon, Iapetus. Yeah. yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Uh, um, it, I, 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 I have not heard the theory, Philip, but I, I'm not surprised and I wouldn't be surprised that it would be home to entities like that. Uh, the real question, Philip, is if you look at pictures of Iapetus and put them next to George Lucas's Death Star, the resemblance is too overwhelming. So yeah. the real question is, what did George Lucas know? When did he know it, and how did he know it? Yeah, that's the question I have. Exactly. Jan Jan one hundred eight asks: Can the AI entities that I guess Musk are worried about not only inhabit the system computers, but also entrance or possess those interacting with it? Yeah, I would think so. I would. That might be that might be one of the objectives. Of some of someone involved with the even the development of this. 
Yeah, I, I would think so. so. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm one of those nutcases that thinks that the scan rates in high definition liquid crystal televisions has been deliberately designed to entrain you. Um, I I have experienced something watching those televisions that I've never experienced before in my life, and that's narcolepsy. I can literally just zonk out trying to watch movies on these things. Oh wow, yeah. Uh, Mete Aksoy again. Is there any connection between the so-called immortal Falconelli or Count of San Germain and the Watchers? I guess in reference. Oh to wow, Nicole, good one. You know, I uh, listen. I I had not thought of that speculation, but hey, <laughs> it would make perfect sense to me. Why do we have these? You know so-called human beings that pop up every now and then and appear to, you know, live a long time or at least claim to. And then yeah. they document it with all sorts of strange, you know, quote unquote proofs. Uh, I, I, I really think that's an intriguing speculation. I really do doff my hat. <laughs> Olive Eisner again, does Dr. Farrell believe that AI is already sentient? I think some of them could be. The problem is, the problem is, I think you're dealing, it's not just an AI, okay? I think it's entirely possible that there are several of them, and I think it's entirely possible that several of them may be sentient. There was, if you don't know the series, Olive, there was a series on um, CBS years and years ago with uh, the actor Jim Caviezel, called person of interest mm -hmm. and it's all about ai and the ai in the series is sentient but along comes another ai and it's sentient and they go to war with each other and we're just the gnats in the way <laughs> okay so here's an oh this is interesting um Joanne Dwyer, didn't fugitives take hold of the horns of the altar to find mercy, to receive getting, mercy? Get, getting close. But again, Joanne, that does not explain why are they there? What's going on? And why are they on the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> and that you did not want to grab a hold of. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, <laughs> okay, um, writer, I'm going to let you uh, communicate directly with Joseph on that. Um, okay, let me see. Oh, uh, here's an interesting question, and we're going to be wrapping up here in a moment, so I'm just going to be taking a couple more questions because we're already past the two-hour oh, mark. Boy. Do tornadoes, demand asks, oh. do tornadoes change space-time? I love that one. <laughs> I love that one. Listen, uh, demand on my on my website, in the members area, I have a paper about tornadoes and that precise topic short answer is i do think that there is very possibly some hyper dimensional nature to those types of intense vorticular storms and i also argue that if that's the case those types of storms are principally electromagnetic in nature and not this business about hot air up here and cold air down here, and they start a vortex to exchange places. The, in other words, the thermal explanation of tornadoes and hurricanes, I think, is secondary to the electromagnetic phenomenon at work. And here's why. There are many cases of witnesses who have been in their basements or 
so on, when a tornado funnel has passed directly over them. Mm -hmm. And they're able to look up inside the funnel. And what they see oftentimes inside the funnel are lightning displays like crazy going on inside of it. Mm -hmm. So that to me tells me, number one, this is a primarily electromagnetic phenomenon. And what suggests to me that they are hyperdimensional is all those stories that you have of records or needles or blades of straw and things like this driven into cement or driven into tree trunks. I do not buy the explanation that this is being done simply by the wind of the storm only. I think the other possible explanation is a dimensional collapse. Why? Because those stories are eerily similar to the stories of the Philadelphia experiment, where you have people embedded into the bulkheads of the ship after the electromagnetic field is turned off. I think the follow-up question to ponder um, is, what did L. Frank Baum know about tornadoes? I'm not, what did he know? L. Frank I, Baum, the author of Wizard of I know of who Alana. he is. I know yes. who he is. Think about it. He writes a story yeah. about a young girl who's taken away yeah. to another land via, or tor via a tornado. Via a tornado. And you're talking right. dimensional physics here. Makes me wonder if uh, yeah. he had learned something about the idea of tornado. That could be. I never thought of that. Well, tunnel to another dimension. I would never so. thought of that because, but it's an interesting hypothesis because the rest of the story is so heavily allegorical. I mean, when you when you decrypt what's actually going on there. Oh yeah, oh, and the yeah. time period that's going on. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly yeah. that too. So well. I think that's where we're going to leave it today, Joseph. And uh, okay. I want to thank you for uh, for being here at the at the channel again. It's always a great conversation, and I know the subscribers and the viewers love it. So we will definitely look forward to the next time. And uh, um, can where do, can people? Oh yeah, yeah do yeah, a plug gonna, and everything. Yeah, well, I wanted to plug one book in particular since we were talking about uh, Enoch, and that's oops, oops. Can that, yeah, uh, the Tower of Babel moment. Uh, this is kind of a big format book. That's the cover. It's on Lulu. You can find it on my website, but it's, it's a Lulu book. But I talk a lot about Enoch in this book. So if people are interested uh, more in what I have to say about, uh, about that text, they can find it in the Tower of Babel moment. The Where can they find it? Uh, the subtitle of that is Lore, Language, Leibniz, and Lunacy. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, go ahead and tell everybody where they can get. Um, I had mentioned the demon book on Amazon. but uh, Well, you can get all of my books on my website. So just go to my website. And the reason I suggest that is the books will still come from Amazon or Lulu. But if you buy them off my website, I get a few little more pennies for royalties. And yes. Uh, with the Biden Enco regime in charge in Swampington, D.C., I need all the help with with the excruciating tax burden that this wonderful government is going to impose upon me this year. So, so that's my plea. So buy them so off the, my website. The website is uh, www.gizadestar.com. There we go. There we go. So great. Cool. Well, we will look forward to uh, seeing you again here. Well, and, thanks for having uh, me, Walter. Oh, hey, thanks for thanks for coming on again. And you'll be hearing from me on this this horned altar thing. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm because I'm keenly interested. So, OK, Joseph, you have a good night and um, we will we will talk to you soon. Oops. I cut you off too soon. What? Oh, that's all right. I just said Sim Sim Salabim. You know? oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Have a good night. Salami, Effendi. But <laughs> <laughs> good night. Okay. okay, everybody. Thanks again uh, for being here and a wonderful turnout tonight. I want to thank all of you. This was a fantastic turnout for uh, Dr. Farrell. And um, I, I, I do. I thank all of you and, and I thank. Uh, the uh, super chatter 
donators tonight. Thank you. Um, every little bit helps, as Joseph said. And uh, you guys have a good night wherever you're at. Stay safe in the weather. And Malia and I will be back Friday night for our usual Friday night episode. So have a good night, everybody. Thanks again.